Hey guys, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to another Victober video. Uh, today, I thought we would talk about some of my favorite male characters in Victorian literature. Now, last year I did a video on some of my favorite female characters in Victorian literature and I wanted to do an updated version of that this year because I only did, I think, five female characters last year and of course there are far more to discuss. But I thought what might be an interesting addendum would be some of my favorite men in Victorian literature because we never talk about the guys as much, do we? I tried not to just be predictable and pick the same books that I used last year and just say the male leads in those books, but a lot of them are here because a lot of times when the female characters are great, so are the male characters. If you nail character, you nail character. But uh, let's just get into my list. I'm sure I am forgetting some. I know that I am because I've already thought of a few that are not on my list, but let's just get right into it. First off, I would like to discuss John Thornton. And I think Margaret Hale deserves to be on a female characters list, but John Thornton is so swoon-worthy to me. This is my favorite love story or romantic story in Victorian literature that I have read so far, and I think that's due in large part to who John Thornton is as a character. And what I really appreciate about him is that he is the one that pursues her. She's a little bit late in recognizing her feelings for him, but he kind of knows by page 100 or so, he knows, hey, I have feelings for her and I might as well be upfront about it and she can take me or she can leave me, but I can't suffer like this. I need her to know that I have these feelings for her. That's just refreshing for me because I think really in modern literature a lot, and even sometimes really in classic literature, we're used to seeing the female characters kind of pining over their love interest and wishing that he would pay them attention. And so it was interesting to see the roles reversed here with John Thornton. And that's why I think he's a little bit swoon worthy. There are a couple of scenes in here that I just think are so romantic and really wonderful. Uh, this book in general is high romance in my opinion and I like it better than Pride and Prejudice which it is often compared to because North and South also deals pretty heavily with kind of social and political commentary on industrialization uh, and I think that's due in large part to John Thornton. John Thornton is a mill owner. Margaret Hale is from the South of England and she's not really into all that uh, and so they come from two very very different backgrounds and the hate to love here is done in a way where I really enjoy it. Hate to love is not typically a trope that I agree with, but I think it's done very well here. And once again, that's due to John. I think John is really wonderful. He seems just gentle and kind and he's very respectful when she doesn't want to have anything to do with him or if she needs time to herself to be with her father or her other family members. He's very respectful of that. And of every character that I will talk about today, he's definitely the most intriguing romantic partner. He's certainly the one you would want to be with. And I'm not just saying that because Richard Armitage played him in the BBC miniseries. I promise I'm not. Next, I wanted to discuss Robert Audley from Lady Audley's Secret. And I was really charmed by Robert Audley when I read this last year because he's so funny. I mean, he's really witty and clever and it comes across very well. He never comes across haughty or as if he knows that he's better than you are because he is so witty and clever. He's just a genuinely funny person. Now, I do have kind of an issue with how the book portrays him in the latter half. And I've talked about this before. I do think there is a weird switch in character, not just for Robert Audley, but for a lot of the characters towards the very last half of Lady Audley's secret. And I think it's done so that the mystery of the book can be solved in a really satisfying way, but it requires the characters to change some. And you can definitely understand why Robert Audley would go through some changes giving what he's seen, but I didn't like it. And so I really am talking about Robert Audley from the first three quarters or so of Lady Audley's Secret when I say he's a favorite character. But for those first few parts, Robert Audley is just so much fun to be around. He's a really enjoyable character to follow. Next, I thought we could discuss Fred Vincy, who is my favorite character in Middlemarch. And I know, I know that's a bit of a controversial opinion, but 
I just love Fred Vinci. Fred Vinci kind of feels to me, and he kind of occupies a place in the narrative similar to uh, Natasha's brother in War and Peace. I don't know his name because I've never read War and Peace, but I have watched the miniseries, the BBC miniseries, and they kind of are both characters who lose a lot of money gambling and basically their family is very disappointed in them and what are you going to do to earn our respect for you back? And so in a way, Fred Vinci is kind of a humorous character. I don't think it's naturally intended to be that way, but it comes across very humorous because he's a very overdramatic kind of guy. And to me, his story is one of the most enjoyable aspects about Middlemarch. And I think he's somebody that nobody discusses when we're discussing Middlemarch. I know that there's a lot of interest in Dorothea in particular, but Fred, for me, is a really dynamic character. Against Dorothea, against Carl Saban, against Dr. Lydgate, I think Fred does fall a little bit for people, but for me, he was easily the most enjoyable part about Middlemarch. Next, I wanted to discuss Diggory Vin from Return of the Native. And so this is a recent love of mine. I really found Diggory Vin refreshing. He was just such a really sweet and kind character. And he really spent the majority of this novel kind of secretly in love uh, with a woman. And yet she never caught on because he was never blatant about it. He knew that she wanted to be with somebody else, that she could potentially be happier with somebody else. And so he never really let it come out. So you can imagine there's a lot of agony and a lot of pining and there are instances where he almost, he almost has the chance to tell her but it's snatched right out from under him and you just feel a lot of pain for Diggory Ben. As a love interest, he's very refreshing to me because he's not somebody who is very forceful about his affections, but I also found him to just be a genuinely good person. I thought that he he really cared about people in town. He really cared about the people of Agden Heath, and he didn't do anything for them to make himself rise in his love interest's eyes. And I just really respected that. I have a bit of a crush on Diggory Venn right now uh, because there was just a moment in this book where he did something for somebody and I it just broke my heart because I felt so sorry for him and I wanted him to be happy. I also think Damon Wild Eve from Return of the Native is also an extremely dynamic character. He's not a very nice guy, but he has one of the coolest names of all time. So he has to be on this list, doesn't he? Return of the Native is very complex in that it basically has kind of a love square maybe even like a love pentagon. There are multiple sides to this love square and multiple different ways things could go, and they definitely go most of those places. Uh, but it's interesting that the men were so dynamic and were so opposite to one another. Damon Wild Eve and Diggory Venn were very different from each other. There is another male character here named Clem Yeobright. He doesn't really need to be on this list because Damon Wild Eve was just you know, a star. And the diamond in the rough was Diggory Venn. He was so swoon worthy. I really enjoyed Diggory's parts in this book. Uh, this is a really wonderful book in general, and it had some really fantastic female characters as well. But I just really wanted to discuss Diggory Venn because I have a bit of a crush on him right now. I'm kind of nursing a crush on him. And Damon Wildeve, to be kind of a bad boy, he's also a really interesting figure. This novel has a lot of really excellent characters in it, not just male characters, but definitely, I definitely wanted to mention Diggory then, and to a lesser extent, Damon Wild Eve. Okay, yeah, we've got to talk about Heathcliff. So this is Heathcliff from Wuthering Heights, and I know I talked about Kathy and Nellie last year, but Heathcliff is who most people remember from Wuthering Heights, and I think there's a reason for that, is that he's a horrible person. Uh, he really, really is a horrible person. He's mean, uh, and he's mean in a way that you understand, and so he gets a lot of sympathy from the reader, even as he does things that are absolutely horrific. Uh, and I just find Heathcliff to be a really interesting character uh, because I think people cut him some slack in a way that they don't with Kathy, which kind of makes me irritated because I love Kathy, and I think when Kathy says she and Heathcliff are the same, they definitely are. They are the same. Uh, and so if you're not going to judge Heathcliff for doing things, why are you judging Kathy? But that's a discussion.
for another day. I really love Heathcliff and not as a kind of Byronic or romantic hero at all. I just think he's a very thought-provoking character. And his is an instance where you wonder what might have happened with him if he had taken a different path in life, if another family had taken him in, or if he'd stayed on the streets. Would Heathcliff have become who he is in this novel? Wuthering Heights in general is just a very complex narrative and it leaves you with a lot to think about. There are a lot of what ifs, but Heathcliff is, I think, the most memorable character in Wuthering Heights for a lot of people and I definitely understand why. Wuthering Heights is a very dark book and a very gothic book, I think in large part due to who Heathcliff is as a character. Uh, so I definitely wanted to mention him on this list, not just because Wuthering Heights is one of my favorites of all time, but because I do think Heathcliff is a character that leaves you with a lot to think about. Next, I wanted to talk about Sidney Carton from A Tale of Two Cities. And yes, I have talked about this book ad nauseum this year, but Sidney is for me really the only true character in A Tale of Two Cities. He's the only one who feels well-rounded and he's also the only character that you feel like goes through a true arc. His is a character archetype that I just typically really enjoy. And that's somebody who starts out kind of mean and selfish and somebody who really acts out because they don't want other people to care about them. And then they really go through a change and come out the other side as a better person and embracing uh, people's affection for them and embracing their affection for others. And Sidney really exemplifies that here. He is just such a wonderful example of that character archetype. And it's his characterization that makes A Tale of Two Cities work. Without Sidney Carton, this whole book falls apart. I mean, really, there's nothing to it. Without him, there is no emotional heart, there is no emotional beat, and there's certainly not the ending. Uh, the ending is what nails A Tale of Two Cities for a lot of people. It's what makes A Tale of Two Cities utterly memorable and a really emotional experience for a lot of people. That was certainly the case for me. I think if you had done that with another character or another type of character than Sydney it wouldn't have worked nearly as well. And I don't think we'd be talking about A Tale of Two Cities at all today. Uh, so Sydney is definitely the reason why A Tale of Two Cities as a book works in my opinion. And he's also just for me, not only a standout in what I've read from Dickens so far, but he is a standout in Victorian literature. I would have to say Sydney Carton is potentially my favorite character that is on this list here today. I just really, really love him. Next, let's talk about The Men from Far From the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Uh, this is a really long list if we're just going to be talking about the men in Far From the Madding Crowd, but I couldn't pick just one. A lot of people really love Gabriel Oak, and Gabriel Oak does kind of stand out above the rest in this book as maybe the best of them. I actually don't much care for Gabriel Oak, uh, and I don't appreciate some of the things he had to say to Bathsheba, but that's just me. But the antagonist here, I won't say who he is just for spoiler's sake, but the antagonist here is really, really wonderful. And I just found him a very dynamic character and somebody who I was really attracted to in the narrative. I kind of really wanted him to go through some kind of change and come out the other side a better person, you know? Uh, that's, of course, not really what happens with an antagonist in Victorian literature. Farmer Boldwood is also really charming and I feel sorry for him. This book makes you feel really sorry for him as well. Uh, there are just a lot of dynamic characters in Far From the Madding Crowd. There are a lot of dynamic characters in Thomas Hardy's novels in general. I think he's got character pretty much nailed. Uh, but this is an instance where there were three kind of main guys and I found each of them incredibly well fleshed out and all of them very distinctive, very, very different from one another. And I think that's a hard thing to achieve, especially when each of them want to play the role of love interest as well. Let's talk about Joe from Great Expectations. No, we're not talking about Pip. I highly, highly dislike Pip, uh, and I really hate what he does to Joe in parts of this book, uh, but Joe is a good person. Joe is somebody who Pip knows from his old life, and Joe never changes. Joe is always, always a good person, and he really cares for Pip, and when Pip's fortunes change, 
he also kind of starts to feel like maybe he's better than his old way of life. And so the way he treats Joe really leaves you in a lot of pain uh, because Joe doesn't understand it. I think Joe is a very typical Dickensian character or a Dickensian side character in that he fills many different roles in the narrative and he also is just kind of this down-home good guy that everybody knows. I think Joe is really the emotional heart of Great Expectations. That's just me. And this is an interesting novel because I would say, you know, Pip is definitely the main character and Estella is probably the main female character and I really like her. But this is one where I would say the side characters all outshine the main character and are more memorable to me than him. And it's just somewhat because I dislike Pip and I recognize that. But Joe is such a wonderful layered side character and I think he's just such a good person. He's such a good person and I really despise Pip the way he talks to him at some points. And I also kind of want to discuss Magwitch. I don't for spoiler sake if you don't know who Magwitch is, but I think he's also a very dynamic and also kind of characteristic Dickensian character. Uh, and I think it works really well in Great Expectations. These kind of character archetypes like Joe and Magwitch fulfill really, really work well in Great Expectations. And they are part of why Great Expectations on the whole feels like a very great novel and feels very well-rounded, feels like everything has its place. Uh, I think without Joe, Pip is not humanized enough, in my opinion. Pip doesn't seem as real without his connection back to Joe or his connection to Magwitch. Uh, so Pip's characterization, even though I dislike him, I think he is a very good, well-rounded character because I'm so irritated by some of the decisions he makes. But I think on their own, the side characters here stand up just as much as he does as the main character, which is a really interesting thing to say. Next, let's talk about Walter from The Woman in White. Uh, now, Walter doesn't stand out as much as some of the antagonists in The Woman in White or Marion, who is a really fabulous female character that I discussed in that video last year. But I also really like Walter because I'm kind of discovering through this video that I have a type. It's that he's a very quiet, gentle sort who doesn't force his opinions on anybody. And so he does have a love interest. And I think his love story is really quite quaint, even though she doesn't feel as dynamic as some of the other characters in the narrative of The Woman in White. His feelings for her are so genuine and sweet. And I like him in a similar way to Dickory Venn from Return of the Native or John Thornton. I really like a soft hero uh, and Walter is definitely that. He's an artist and I think that's something you can definitely see. You sense that Walter is an artist, that that's the way he interprets the world, that that's how he sees people around him. Uh, and so I think that gives him kind of a romanticism and a sweetness that some of the other characters in the narrative don't have and it makes him very distinctive for me in Victorian literature. Last but not least, I'm going to talk about a very controversial figure in Victorian literature, and that's Rochester from Jane Eyre. I really love Rochester, and I've said it before and I'll say it again, I'm kind of into him, uh, but I recognize he's not a good person. Uh, he's done a lot of terrible things. I mean, really, really terrible things that are never explored to the degree that you really would like them to be in Jane Eyre. But I think that's what makes the book in general and Rochester in particular very interesting is that I think you are meant to walk away from this book with some questions and to feel kind of weird about Jane and Rochester's relationship and how you interpret that, whether you interpret Rochester as having changed or having been punished for some of the things that he's done, whether you think that's good enough or whether you really appreciate Jane and what she wants and you know that she's really into him, but then you question whether or not she should be into him. It's just a very thought-provoking novel in that way. And I think that's due in large part to Jane, of course. Rochester is just not discussed to that degree, and I think I understand that. But I think we should be talking about Rochester, not just as a romantic hero, but as perhaps the villain of the piece. I think that would be a really interesting discussion to have. 
I just really appreciate Rochester's kind of Byronic vibe uh, and also the relationship that he forms with Jane. Even if you don't want it to happen, even if you feel conflicted about it, as Jane does herself, their relationship is something that is pretty blatantly put on the page. I think no matter how you feel about him, Rochester deserves to be on a list like this because he's certainly a character that I always come back to and that I want to discuss more. Maybe this calls for a Rochester video. Let me know what you think about that down below. But Rochester is one that I don't think we discuss enough, weirdly enough. You would think that we do, considering how often everyone brings up Jane Eyre as a novel. But Rochester is always either mentioned in one off, oh, he's terrible, or oh, he's great. And we don't really dive deep into it, you know? Uh, so Rochester is the last on my favorite male characters in Victorian literature list. I'm sure there are tons more. I've already thought of some that I have definitely forgotten. Uh, but please tell me down below some of your favorite male characters in Victorian literature and how you feel about some of the ones that were on my list. But that's gonna be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.